Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening for some. It's really nice to see you. My name is Marie Dennis. I know many of you. A big welcome to all of you. We have all watched in horror as the Russian invasion of Ukraine escalated into a war of immense brutality with vicious attacks on civilians and essential infrastructure and an ominous threat to use nuclear weapons. This war highlights all that war and vicious violence have wrought in Yemen and Afghanistan and Syria and Colombia, in Myanmar and Iraq and Ethiopia and South Sudan, the DR Congo, Guatemala, Palestine and beyond. The war in Ukraine is not more important than the other wars destroying human lives and the earth. But as the tablet editorialized a few weeks ago, it is quote, history making, game changing, paradigm shifting. We begin our conversation this afternoon with a message from Sister Wamuyu Wachira, the co-president of Pax Christi International, from Nairobi, Kenya. Peace to you all gathered here. Each year during Holy Week, which begins this weekend, Christian communities around the world gather to recreate the story of Jesus' passion and death. In dramatic public liturgies, we remember who we are as people of faith, and why we believe that even the greatest of evils will not have the last word. We enter this Holy Week in a time of war, in what Pope Francis calls a Third World War fought piecemeal. In Yemen and Colombia, Syria and the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia and Myanmar, Afghanistan and South Sudan, in communities protecting their land and water from exploitative mining, in favelas, barrios, and street corners, and now in Ukraine. We also remember that during the brutal Roman occupation of Palestine, Jesus was fully engaged in nonviolent efforts to change systems of violence and oppressive injustice at the roots of suffering and exclusion. Not only did he live nonviolently himself, but he used nonviolent actions to fight for social justice peace and inclusive communities. This week, even as we wait for the resurrection of Jesus, we remember that Jesus was crucified because of the way he lived, that he was crucified because he was upsetting an unjust and violent system, that he died as he lived, expressing forgiveness for those who were killing him. And he invited his followers to do the same, to love their enemies, to become nonviolent seekers of justice and peace, to forgive and repent, to build the beloved community. This is an important week then to reflect on the structural, cultural, and ecological violences for which we are responsible, on the wars that are raging, and perhaps most especially on the war in Ukraine, where powerful lessons about nonviolent conflict and nonviolent resistance abound. May our God of new beginnings and kindle in us a new heart and a new spirit, that we may follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who lived and exemplified a nonviolent way of being and doing. Come, Lord Jesus, let our hearts burn within us as you speak to us. Thank you so much to <clears throat> Wamuyu in Kenya. The war in Ukraine has been examined from every possible angle. The shocking, deliberate, unjustified Russian attacks on civilians and on essential infrastructure, the deep complexity of root causes and culpability on the part of NATO, the US, and so many others, the clash of worldviews and interests, the mind and motives of Russian President Vladimir Putin, 
the impact of nationalism and disinformation, the role of the Russian Orthodox and other churches, the palpable threat of nuclear or chemical warfare, the usefulness of a just war or a just peace framework. But critically important stories about creative, active nonviolence in Ukraine and Russia must also be told. We are so grateful that Maria Stefan is with us to help us understand what she calls a moment of profound moral clarity. Maria is now chief organizer and co-lead at the Horizon Project. She is an award-winning author and an organizer whose work has focused on the role of nonviolent action and peace building in advancing human rights, democracy, and sustainable peace in the United States and globally. Maria is the co-author with Erica Chenoweth of Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, and of their second book, The Role of External Support in Nonviolent Campaigns, Poisoned Chalice or Holy Grail. Maria previously worked at the US Institute of Peace, where she founded and directed the Program on Nonviolent Action. She served as lead foreign service affairs officer in the US State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, where her work included projects in Afghanistan and with Syrian activists in Turkey. Maria has also worked at the Atlantic Council and at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and she has taught at both Georgetown and American universities. Maria, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Marie, so much for that introduction. And thank you to you and to Pax Christie International for hosting today's conversation. Um, I'm so grateful for the tireless role that, that Pax Christie continues to play in shining a light on the often less uh, noticed, less appreciated stories of nonviolence and nonviolent resistance and its role in combating war and tyranny and authoritarianism. Uh, in Ukraine and also around the around the world. Um, and I so appreciated hearing um, the beautiful remarks from Sister Wamuyu earlier and how she articulated the interconnectedness of these different struggles that are happening around the world. And while today we'll be focusing on, um, you know, the brutal aggression and resistance in Ukraine, uh, these struggles are so connected, whether in Yemen or DRC or even in the United States, as we as we battle brutality of racism, um, authoritarianism in our own country, and really appreciating both the interconnectedness of these struggles and also the importance of transnational solidarity to be able to combat war, violence, tyranny together as a global community, I think is so critically important. Um, and, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on, as someone who worked uh, on Syria at the State Department and just reflecting on, you know, a, a peaceful revolution that began with nonviolent protests and demonstrations involving so many uh, parts of the Syrian population and then transformed into violent civil war. And the role uh, that Vladimir Putin played in backing the Assad regime and supporting the use of barrel bombs, of chemical weapons. Um, and so we've seen this pattern um, of, of Russian support for aggression before. And you know, earlier, uh, many years ago, I, I worked um, at a Russian human rights organization called the Soldiers Mothers Organization. And at that time, it was right after the second war between Russia and Chechnya. And I was working with these mothers who were desperately trying to get their Russian sons out of the ranks of the military and to prevent them from being conscripted into the army where there was terrible abuses being committed, not only amongst soldiers, but certainly towards Chechens um, and others. And it just made me reflect on just how uh, interconnected violence and brutality can be and how it's showing up um, in the scorched earth policy that we're seeing um, being enacted by the Russian regime in, in Ukraine. Um, so I'm going to start a PowerPoint presentation if um, my tech 
uh, skills permit, let's see. All right, there we go. Is that working for everyone? Great. Um, so as Marie mentioned, you know, there, it is such a complex, uh, complicated situation in Ukraine. Yet at the same time, I do believe this is like a very momentous global event. And I think we are seeing tectonic shifts happening. And there really is an appreciation um, that we're facing. We're seeing kind of a David and Goliath scene playing out in Ukraine um, between people who are struggling to protect themselves and to defend democracy uh, against authoritarianism and against violence and war and aggression. And so I'll I want to talk a little bit about you know, some of the remarkable civil resistance and nonviolent action we're seeing both inside Ukraine uh, in the face of Russian aggression and occupation, and also inside Russia and in the region, including the international community. And I was really struck by this particular image that I saw today um, on your left. It's, it's a picture of a six-year-old boy uh, who is who brought canned food to the graveside of his mother who was starved to death in Buka. And I'm sure you all have been seeing the scenes from Buka. And then on the right, of course, Mariupol, which has been decimated and destroyed in the context of barrage of, you know, aerial attacks, bombings and shellings, just to offer like the context in which we're having, you know, this conversation. And while it's true that right now we're looking at two armies facing off, two armies of two sovereign countries in an interstate war, there is also a very powerful form of popular resistance being waged by ordinary people, which I would argue will play a very important role in ending the Russian aggression and in paving the way for an eventual reconciliation between the Russian and Ukrainian people. So just to show some images, and when I'm using the term civil resistance, I'm talking about a method of waging conflict that involves the use of nonviolent direct action tactics like vigils, boycotts, strikes, civil disobedience, mass non-cooperation, blockade sit-ins, all used to shift power dynamics and to impose costs on an, on an opponent without the threat or use of violence. So that's the definition that I'll be using when talking about civil resistance today. And right now, inside Ukraine, in towns, villages, cities that have been invaded and occupied by Russian forces, you are seeing actions by ordinary unarmed civilians to stop, thwart, and slow the uh, invasion of Russian troops, tanks, convoys, including these scenes in Harrison and, and Melitopol, where you've had literally people putting their bodies in front of tanks and convoys, in some cases, forcing them to turn around and leave the, the cities or towns. And, you know, in Kherson, you probably have seen this image of the elderly uh, Ukrainian woman who approached an invading soldier, Russian soldier, and began to engage with him, confronted him. Why have you invaded my country? Go home, you know, leave us in peace. And so these scenes are playing out all over the country right now in Ukraine. I was so amazed by this particular scene in the south of uh, Ukraine, where uh, the deputy mayor, so this, this, this village is currently occupied by Russian forces, and the deputy mayor was kidnapped um, by Russian soldiers, and the entire village came out to demand that this deputy mayor be released successfully. And so you're seeing this again, people are going out protesting, standing in front of Russian troops and convoys, demanding that they go home. And, you know, so it's setting the scene, we will not accept this invasion, you were told that you would be welcomed by us as liberating forces. This is what you were told, but this is not true. This is not the case. This is not a country full of Nazis, what you've been told as part of your mission. So remarkably powerful scenes. 
Also, you know, I was very much touched by the scene of Ukrainians offering a soldier who surrendered and defected. They offered him tea, food, and called his mother in Russia. And so just this contrast between the compassion of ordinary Ukrainians and the barbarity of the Russian in, uh, uh, invasion is kind of on display in this scene. And you know, if, if folks on this call have not listened to President Zelensky's um, televised appeal to the Russian people, I would encourage you to do so. Um, because in his speech, he was calling on a great Russian people, friends of Ukraine, to end the war in Ukraine. And it was remarkable in that, you know, President Zelensky is trying so hard not to dehumanize Russians and instead to welcome them to stop the aggression so that peaceful coexistence can be possible. And I shared this um, Twitter thread because I think this is a particularly important dynamic um, in Ukraine, that there are a lot of actions now being used to incentivize defections by Russian soldiers, which we know is a key dynamic in successful civil resistance campaigns. So here you see the Russian um, government offering amnesty essentially uh, for Russian defectors. Uh, European governments are similarly starting to discuss offering asylum to Russian soldiers and their families who defect. So I think this is one very important nonviolent option for putting an end to this war. And, you know, notwithstanding an incredibly difficult, violent, uh, repressive environment in Russia, where any form of protest and dissent speaking out against the war um, is met with criminal arrest, prosecution, we're seeing protest demonstrations happening in thousands of towns and villages across the country. So I live for a time in St. Petersburg, so I'm very familiar with the Nevsky Prospekt, which is the image on the left where you had hundreds of uh, Russians coming out and protesting the war. You all may have seen this image of the Russian woman who had lived through the Nazi invasion of her country uh, coming out to say no to war. She was arrested. When she was released, she went right back out um, in St. Petersburg and began to protest again. So these are some of the scenes. We've also been seeing uh, remarkable acts of dissent by what I would refer to as key pillars inside Russia. So these are the organizations and institutions that are holding up Putin's regime and making authoritarianism aggression possible. And the key thing about civil resistance and kind of the secret to the success of civil resistance is when people People within these key pillars of support stop providing their consent and cooperation and start engaging in acts of dissent and non-cooperation. This is what shifts the balance of power. And this is what ultimately severs an authoritarian from his pillars of support. So this is how I believe the war will eventually end um, when there is enough mass organized dissent happening in Ukraine, in Russia, around the world. So on the left, you all may have seen that even though the Russian Orthodox Church and Patriarch Kirill has uh, blessed the war essentially, very controversially, there have been a number of Russian Orthodox priests who have come out to condemn the war. So this uh, particular uh, this particular priest is Reverend Burdeen, who is a priest with the Resurrection of Christ Orthodox Church. And he joined uh, the letter writing with I think around 200 other priests to say, I, it, it, you know, my conscience dictates that I speak out against this war. And so that's a critical pillar of support. And then the scene of the editor of the most popular Russian television news station, who in the middle of a live broadcast walked out with this sign that said no to war. And she directly told the Russian people during the live broadcast, you are being lied to. 
Um, she was arrested. I believe she was later released. But this is, again, a critical pillar where more dissent would mean, uh, you know, significant difficulties for Vladimir Putin. And then the scene on the right is um, the Russian tennis star, Andrei Rublev, who after a victory, and I think it was the Dubai tennis competition, um, you know, tennis players are often invited to write something on the, on the, uh, on the camera screen. So he wrote, no to war. Uh, again, a pretty brave act and knowing that you know you could face significant consequences back in Russia. So these are the acts of civil resistance that are happening. I was particularly struck by the image on the right. So this um, young woman, I think she's about 15 or 16 years old. Her name is Olga Misik, and she's known as Russia's Tiananmen teen. And you see her sitting there in the front of a group of riot police reading the Russian constitution and demanding an end to the war. And so again, these are the acts of defiance. And I included you know, the images of the women and mothers protesting, because I think the role of women and mothers in showing dissent and demanding an end to the war is going to be very key. And I remember from research and when I was working with soldiers, mothers in Russia, I had studied the role of Russian and Chechen women who literally marched onto the battlefield to demand the return of their sons and to demand an end to the war and ultimately played a critical role in the end to the first Russian Chechen war. So these are the key pillars and the key dissenters. And then, of course, the other battlefield, nonviolent battlefield, if you will, where civil resistance and nonviolent action is taking place is in, is in the international realm. All around the world, we've seen mass protests, demonstrations, vigils, sit-ins. I was just walking by the uh, Ukrainian embassy in Georgetown the other day and was struck by the images, the candlelights, the teddy bears, the, the signs, the written notes of solidarity. So you're seeing this play out around the world, which has been quite remarkable. And I think you know many of these uh, demonstrations have been led by members of the Ukrainian diaspora um, who have been very active and involved. I saw a number of these marches and demonstrations in New York City. Um, and so I, I think you know, this is just a sign that people are coming together to demand an end to the war. But it's also a sign, I think, of an, in the midst of this tragedy, of an opportunity to come together and not only demand an end to war, but to demand a massive reallocation of investments and a massive reinvestment in nonviolent alternatives, in support for nonviolence, in support for civil resistance, nonviolent organizing, in civilian based defense, which, by the way, countries in Europe have adopted civilian based defense, which is a strategy for unarmed mass non-cooperation in the event of a military invasion and occupation. So Lithuania, for example, has integrated civilian-based defense in their national security strategy and other Baltic countries have done the same. So now is the time to demand of religious congregations, religious leadership, and certainly our governments to make a much greater investment in nonviolent options and to continue to amplify the stories of civil resistance, nonviolent struggle that are happening in Ukraine, Russia, the region, internationally. We need to get these stories out so that not only do the nonviolent resistors see that we're with them, that eyes are on them, but that people know that this is a legitimate, powerful means of challenging tyranny and aggression. It works. We know from the research that nonviolent resistance has been twice as effective as armed struggle. So there's a lot of work out there that we know that we can invest in. So even though there's a lot of focus now in increasing military support to Ukraine, increasing defense budgets, now's the time to say, okay, we also need to be putting massively more attention, focus, emphasis on a methodology of waging struggle and waging peace that is far more effective in the short term and longer term. And that, I think, is now both the challenge and also the opportunity of our moment. So maybe with that, I'll, I'll um, leave it to question and answer. Um, 
Maria, thank you very much. That was very a lot to think about. And we would invite your questions. We have some time now for uh, questions and um, discussion. So I would invite you to either um, use your emoji uh, raise hand function uh, to raise your hand or just wave your hand so we can see it in front of your, of your camera. Questions, comments? Someone asked if we would have this available, uh, the recording of this. Yes, we will. We'll have it uh, available Monday or so. Uh, yes, Catherine. Uh, could you, uh, Maria, could you comment on the, um, the sanctions that are being imposed, not just by the United States, but by other countries as well? You know, I have uh, heard that they can be considered a weapon of war. So would you say a little bit about whether or not they're good to use and whether or not they in fact are in a somewhat of could be a violent means because they affect ordinary citizens that have nothing to do with the waging of the war yeah catherine that that's a great question and you know i should say interestingly maybe two weeks ago um erica chenoweth and i were invited to do a presentation with the national security council in the white house on like options for supporting nonviolent action and nonviolent resistance um and this was one of the first questions that they asked as well well what is the research on sanctions and when are they effective and you know my colleague erica has done a lot of kind of uh, thinking and research and writing about this. And sh and they were saying that, um, you know, the, the story on sanctions is complicated. And you're right that there is a long history of extended sanctions um, harming populations. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Yemen, I'm thinking about Cuba, I'm thinking of a lot of places. And we also saw like in the Syrian context, there were large scale sanctions by the US, a few European countries, some Arab countries. And, you know, Assad in that case was able to go around them um, and was able to secure fund support to kind of keep up, prop up the regime, notwithstanding the sanctions. So I think, you know, what a lot of the research shows is that targeted sanctions of individuals and key perpetrators of violence and their families tend to be effective in changing incentive structures. So you're already seeing kind of targeted sanctions of you know Russian officials, Putin himself, um, his children, because what often happens is that the families of kind of authoritarian leaders are studying in fancy private schools in London and other places. And only when they start to feel it in their pocketbooks and in their inability to, you know, go to these fancy schools and have luxury yachts, do they actually start to do something. So people need to feel economic pressure. So targeted sanctions tend to be effective. I think you know, so the, the, the story on broad based sanctions is where it gets murky and is complicated. And I think, you know, what the strategy is, I understand this, the sanction strategy. One thing I would say that's different in this case compared to other US backed sanctions, where it's often the US going at it alone, I'm thinking Cuba, for example, in other cases, you know, where it's just unilateral sanctions that are putative in nature. In this case, you have almost the entire European continent, um, you know, the EU, other countries involved in a broad based set of sanctions targeting financial institutions. So the theory is that, you know, the sanctions are intended to limit the Russian government's ability to wage war. So stop the transactions of funds, stop the oligarchic base of support for the Putin regime. So in that case, I think those types of sanctions can be very effective at eroding the ability of the Putin regime. Where it then becomes complicated though is, okay, is banning and boycotting all products and services is that helpful? Certainly, if there was humanitarian assistance that needed to get to Russia, cutting that off probably wouldn't be a good idea. So I think, you know, it's not a straightforward story. I can't say good, bad, but that's at least what some of the research on sanctions suggests. 
But another thing, here's another interesting research point on sanctions. Sanctions tend to be most effective. So I'm thinking of this, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. So as you know, this is why, like this case reminds me a lot of the global anti-apartheid struggle that was taking place to end apartheid um, in South Africa, where there was massive sanctions, boycotts, divestment, um, the like, the gamut. It was very internationalized. And in that case, it was the resisting population that was also demanding the sanctions. So people who were protesting were kind of dictating the sanctions. And so it was led by the resistance on the ground. And I think that's an important point. And I, what I would be curious to research is whether prominent Russian dissidents, what they are saying about sanctions and what they are asking for and what they are saying would be most effective. Because I think that would be revelatory um, in terms of, you know, the possible way ahead. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm going to also recommend that you, uh, you certainly can write your questions in the chat um, if you have questions. And with so many people on Zoom, it's a little bit hard for me to see waving hands. I'm looking for them, but um, when you raise your emoji hand, you get moved up uh, to the front of the line so I can see you there, but write in the chat if you're not getting called on. So Leota, yes. Unmute, <laughs> okay. Uh, Maria, thanks. That was a lot of information delivered very quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, at the end, you said now is the time to exert pressure on, on governments and on policymakers to embrace nonviolent uh, uh, resistance. Uh, practically, what do we do? How can we do that? Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's that's a great question. I mean, I think in part, so as we're talking about what the what the US government should do vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, right now the focus is on humanitarian assistance and military aid. Okay. So the appeal needs to be significantly increasing assistance, non-lethal, non-humanitarian assistance. So through various advocacy channels, and Pax Christie is a wonderful channel for advocating, you know, policy investments in non-military alternatives. So making that a, an ask. And I think you will find a lot of resonance and support within the US government for exactly these appeals. Because right now, what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of kind of offices and agencies in the US government that are trying to figure things out and what do we do, how do we invest? So I think this is one particular, very specific area vis-a-vis -vis the US government. There are also a number of non-profit, non-governmental organizations that are now very actively involved in supporting nonviolence and nonviolent resistance in Ukraine in the region. So I shared in the list of resources at the end, the webinar for the Kroc Institute event on civil resistance in Ukraine and the region. And I encourage folks to listen to that only because uh, one of the speakers, Kai Jacobson, who's the executive director of Patrir, um, has been working with other organizations to organize a platform called All for Peace. And All for Peace is being used to both uh, inform, amplify, and coordinate assistance for nonviolence, nonviolent alternatives, and to coordinate policy advocacy vis-a-vis -vis European, US, and other governments. So I encourage, I don't think they're working on a website right now, so I don't, otherwise I would have included a link uh, to the All for Peace website, but at least in that webinar, you'll have a sense of what they are kind of how they're organizing the kinds of asks. The other thing is that uh, Patrir and these organizations were recently in Ukraine where they met with a number of activists, humanitarian assistance leaders and others to listen directly to them about what types of assistance would be most helpful in this moment. So I think hearing what Ukrainians are asking and you know, demanding and you know, trying to be responsive where possible is, is generally a good way to go. So those are, I guess, a few, um, a few immediate thoughts. 
Thank, thank you. And I think Jim, I know his last name, asked in the chat about making all those links live somehow in an email or somewhere yeah. so that- Oh, yes, yes. That. Let me, let me try, I'll, I'll try to do that. If, um, if Maria, if you, if it's difficult for you to do right now, we will also send them all to you, uh, to everybody who registered for the webinar, we'll send uh, that slide so you have those links. I just want to also add one question before we get to um, Father Joran Rosemary. Um, Jean Stoken wrote in the chat a question that relates very much to the last one you answered. What has been the response of US policymakers with whom you've met? Was there any openness? How to build on any openings for the short term on Ukraine and or the long term on military spending? What was the reaction that you got at the National Security Council or in other places, Maria? So there was a lot of interest in how to support um, nonviolence, nonviolent resistance. Um, I mean, a lot, there's always an education element involved of like, what is nonviolent resistance? How does it work to affect change? Um, what are the tactics, the strategies? And, and the very clear notion that civil resistance works because it's led by people living under oppression. Civil resistance doesn't work because the US government is supporting it. And you know, there's a, a whole lot of research about when external support can be helpful and when it can be harmful. But there are certain things that the US government can do and ought to be doing. And so the a lot of the discussion was about, there was a lot of discussion about sanctions. There was a lot of discussion about defections. So what brings about defections in the key pillars of support that I was talking about earlier? Because again, defections are very strongly correlated with successful civil resistance campaigns. So when members of the security forces, um, you know, when members of the state run media, when members of the strong religious establishment, when cultural figures, when educational leaders start saying no and engage in collective stubbornness, that's what shifts the dynamics in these conflicts. So their questions were about like, you know, how does this work? And, you know, how, what can we do that maybe is at least not harming those efforts? Um, because again, I was also very clear that there are certain things the US government absolutely should not be doing. And so, and you know, that's when we had the discussion about certain sanctions. This is when we had the conversation about kind of cer certain funding options. And so a lot was like, how do you support Ukrainian organizations that are already doing this work? And what does that mean? So whether it's through the US Agency for International Development, USAID, whether it's in State Department officials meeting with civil resistors, dissenters, others, listening to them for what they need and what is unhelpful. So, you know, these were some of the things that we were talking about. But my main recommendation, which again, you know, the Euro the US government is a big bureaucracy and like getting it to change or, or shift takes time and effort. And so, you know, based on my experience of trying to support the nonviolent resistors in Syria, which was, you know, just a very, um, very difficult, but also informative experience, I saw so much dysfunctionality in the US government all different offices doing different things, everyone having a piece of the puzzle and thinking that what they're doing is the only thing that matters, very siloed operations. So a lot of my recommendations had to do with how you can align the bureaucracy to coordinate your work and to bring in different perspectives to like have it be part of a holistic strategy as opposed to this office doing this, 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 which can work at cross, cross purposes. So those were some of the things that we were discussing. Some are not sexy for the purpose of this discussion because they're very bureaucratic in nature, but when you're working in government are also very important because that's kind of how, you know, how the work flows, um, having the bureaucracy right. Great, thank you, Maria. Uh, Father Zor, would you, you have a question? Hello, uh, I'm Ivan Zhur. I'm a redemptorist of uh, originally from Ukraine, so war is very close to my heart. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, if you wanted sources on uh, Russian dissidents outside of Russia, I would recommend to look at Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was a Putin's prisoner in prison for 10 years. He served his term. He resides in London and he provides every day a lot of videos, a lot of analysis of where does it goes. So. 
But uh, my question here uh, to you, Maria, is how do we supposed to understand the statement of the Holy See, especially Cardinal Parolin, where he stated a couple of days ago, um, Ukrainians are allowed to use weapons, but nobody is supposed to send them weapons to Ukraine. So if Ukraine runs out from the weaponry to defend itself, according to that statement, Ukrainians, do they suppose just surround Russia? I don't know if you came across that statement from Cardinal Parlin, who is a um, number two in the Catholic Church, and he states this, don't send any weapons. How Do does I that have... sound with nonviolent response? Because um, we're supposed to defend poor and abandoned, and people in Bucha, in Gostomel, in Irpin, today in, Kras, uh, in Energodar, where they've been bombed, etc. How does we supposed to defend them, those most vulnerable? Yeah. And, and why does Pope Francis did not name Russia and Putin as aggressors against the innocent people? There was not a single time the Holy See spoke out the name of aggressor. And as a Catholics, as a Christians, we need to name the evil in order to address the evil. Maybe you can give us some insight from your experience. Thank you. Hmm. That's, that's a great question and a very difficult one. I'm not familiar with that statement and I'm not um, entirely familiar with all kind of the different mach machinations at, at the Vatican on the response to Ukraine. My sense is that the reason, um, the reason Pope Francis would not be naming uh, Putin and calling him out is that he still thinks it's possible to call him in um, and that it's possible to, you know, engage him in dialogue negotiations that could end the war and that naming and calling out would put, you know, would make that type of engagement difficult. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are arguments that could be used in both uh, on both sides because it's true that when you get past a certain point, you do have to call out an evil and take a side, not because it's against Putin, it's about we need to end the war and we need to kind of call out, uh, you know, what is causing it, but in a way that's going to bring in others and other Russian influencers. And who knows what's happening right now in the Kremlin? I mean, I, I know some people are experts in kind of the different movements. And of course, you know, the, the types of like pressure that Putin may be under right now. So it's possible that there are power shifts happening right now. And then the question for, I would imagine the Vatican becomes, how do we navigate these different power dynamics happening right now in the Kremlin? But I think like the most important thing, in my opinion, that, um, that the Vatican could be doing is calling attention to the letter of dissent. And so calling attention to however 100, 200, uh, you know, Russian Orthodox priests who on grounds of you know, conscience and Christian values are calling for an end to the war to amplify those statements um, on grounds of principle and values, I think is one thing and doing whatever possible to ensure that humanitarian assistance convoys are able, humanitarian corridors, that may be another reason why they're not calling out Putin, because the fear is that any negotiations around humanitarian corridors could be thwarted. Although again, Russia doesn't have a great history of adhering to its agreements on things like humanitarian corridors. So so I don't know, it's a really difficult. And Marie, I, I imagine you have some, <laughs> some reflections on this. I think you covered it very well, Maria. Thank you. It's a Thank challenge. You. Thank you both. Thank you. Rosemary. Yeah, hi. I, I feel like what I have to ask is almost a horrible question to have to ask because of 
what father just mentioned. I mean, the, the bombs falling on your head make you really wonder, okay, how do we deal with the reality of, you know, with the destruction that's happening. But uh, as, as much as there are these wonderful examples of nonviolent resistance among civilians, I find President Zelensky not considering nonviolence in any way, shape, or form. And perhaps he can't, I don't know. But we also keep hearing how diplomacy is the only thing that ever ends a war. And what I hear from President Zelensky, it seems, is constantly not only asking for more and more weapons, but I think he wouldn't mind if there were a no-fly zone. And he's constantly, I think, from what I hear you know, on the news, criticizing and complaining that the West isn't doing enough and enough means more weapons, more violence, more. And I just feel like it's pouring gas on a fire and I don't know how you stop when, again, bombs are falling on your home, your hospital, your school. But at the same time, how do we get to somehow or other convince President Zelensky and Putin, you might say, too, although he's harder to reach, I think, um, to open up to these nonviolent ideas because they're not there right now from the leadership, which is where I think ultimately they need to be. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great, um, great reflection. I think Zelensky has been very strong in just like maintaining morale and in sending a clear message that we're against the Russian regime, not the people. I think that's been the strongest aspect of his outreach, but it did come up in one of the earlier conversations, um, the all for peace platform. So the Petrir platform, there's a working group um, uh, that's part of that platform that's focused on uh, nonviolent direct action support to Ukraine, Russia, and the region. So there are a number of different kind of working groups and task force. And, you know, I had, offer just an idea in that context, which was, you know, President Zelensky is really good in front of a camera. He's really good at making videos. What if like someone helped him make a video about what is civil resistance? How is it different from armed self-defense? And what are its applications in this context and in a potential future context? Because right now it's true that it's a little bit difficult to imagine mass organized civil resistance because you still have the massive shellings and bombings and you know the Russian kind of the, the militaries are confronting each other. But what would happen um, in a situation where significant parts of Ukraine are occupied by Russian troops? Then it becomes a question of what is the most effective means of resistance in that context? And one could argue that a pure disciplined nonviolent resistance strategy would actually be more effective and that combining armed insurgency with nonviolence could do what it did in Syria, which is intensify the violence, like get a lot more people killed without necessarily advancing political objectives. So then it needs to be a strategy conversation. And I feel for Zelensky and the leadership because when you are being, and this is why I sympathize with Syrians, when you are being bombed by a vastly superior military and it's coming from all sides and you know they don't respect humanitarian law. You know they are going to target hospitals and schools and civilian populations because they've done it so many times in the past. There is a reason why your, your instinct is to say, give us whatever it's going to take to make the missile stop. So I understand that. But at the same time, then it has to be part of a strategy conversation. What is it going to take to, in the most effective and efficient way possible, to erode Putin of his key pillars of support and to prompt maximum defections? And the problem with armed insurgency, and the, the reason I get nervous about foreign mercenaries coming in, <laughs> is that when armed insurgents confront 
invading and occupying soldiers, they don't tend to defect. They fight back and they kill a lot of civilians. So then it has to be a conversation about how do we protect our people and sever Putin from his pillars of support and what is the role of civil resistance in doing that? I think Zelensky could be brought around to that. It's just like, could someone help develop the video, the transcript, the materials, package it in a way that then he can, you know, and he's not the only one, but of course he's got a lot of attention and he's got a great platform. So that, I mean, I don't, you know, that would be an idea, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Susan. <clears throat> Hi, my question is that the, we've talked about sort of the grassroots. Uh, now I'm thinking about high level. Uh, and so as the violence continues, uh, I'm I'm getting a lot of pushback from people even within my community um, if we talk about dialogue or, or nonviolent response facing such a violent aggressor. So what would be the most effective means of resistance by NATO countries who are just uh, consumed with trying to avoid World War III? So, uh, you know, they've come up with these sanctions, but the violence continues, the violence continues, and all eyes are really looking at Germany. Germany is, is just continuing uh, to buy energy from Russia, and so they're subsidizing the war. What creative means could NATO countries come up with to um, help Germany turn off that spigot? Or, or what other things, um, in, in massive level, all this money we spend on military, could we you know, quickly help Germans heat their homes tomorrow without buying fuel for from Russia? Yeah, that is a great question. And I've, um, I was just reading something today how Putin's like invasion of Ukraine is turning so many people into climate activists. Because of course, if Europe and the West were not reliant upon Russian fossil fuels um, to, for, to fulfill their energy needs, this would make his war of aggression a lot uh, more difficult um, and less likely. So, and linking this, by the way, nonviolence to Laudato Sea, I mean, this is the strongest case for massive like investment in energy alternatives. Um, so you're like, you're thinking in the right direction with this. And I, there are a couple of initiatives I know we're providing some energy sources um, in kind of the temporary in kind of the temporary period. Um, but I, and I think Ger Germany uh, is facing a lot of domestic pressure now to end the import of Russian coal and natural gas. So it'll be interesting because it, again, it's such a difficult balance because the German economists will say, if we turn off the spigot today, we will face a profound economic re recession. And oh, by the way, there's another dynamic happening in the neighboring France. I don't know if you all are watching, but Marine Le Pen, so the daughter of, you know, kind of the far right fascist leader uh, won something like 50 plus percent in the last polls. So there is a concern that you will have a far right leader assume power in France, which has to be making a lot of leaders really nervous about doing anything that would lead to a major economic downturn that always benefits the kind of extremist populist types. So there are like a lot of considerations I imagine right now, but your point of like, let's use this as an opportunity to press for alternatives and alternative investments in alternative energy, I think is absolutely the right one around the world. I mean, how many dictatorships has the United States backed up because we wanted access to oil reserves. It's ridiculous. So like, if we're serious about ending support for authoritarianism, we have to do a massive rethink of our energy consumption for sure. Thank you, Maria. There are a few questions in the chat that maybe we can group together, but are interesting. One was just what, what can individuals do? And how, what, um, uh, is there any um, legislation in uh, moving anywhere in the US Congress that would be kind of like the Burma Act that passed in the House that would call for targeted sanctions and humanitarian assistance? Is there anything like that that you know about going through Congress? 
There is, so this is one area I haven't been paying as much of attention because I should note that my primary focus right now is on the US and preventing authoritarianism in the US. So it's been hard to keep up with everything that's happening in, in Ukraine and some of these other countries. But I know um, there there is something, there is a major spending bill going through Congress. I don't know where it is. Humanitarian assistance is usually kind of the easiest thing to fund. There's usually the less um, resistance. What I've been suggesting is they need to have commensurate focus on non-humanitarian assistance, other non-lethal forms of support, so that it's not just you know, uh, humanitarian as the only nonviolent uh, kind of option. So definitely there's discussion and I think a budget is in place. I don't, I mean, others on this call, I'm sure will be tracking this more. It's maybe an omnibus bill that is, you know, um, in whatever stages, but yes, I know absolutely there's something and a lot of people are working on that and what should be included and who should administer the budget and all this kind of things, which traditionally in the US government leads to territorial fights and food fights. So my friends who are still in government are hoping this can be avoided and that they can just start getting the right offices to do the right things and bring all the pieces together. But this is always a slight challenge for the US government. Thanks, Maria. And we are getting close to the end of our time. I just wanna note John Varani um, noted in the chat that he was part of a 500 Zoom people meditating, focusing on Ukraine. And he asked how the, what kind of the spiritual support can we give to, to those who are courageously living uh, and practicing nonviolence, uh, nonviolent resistance. So um, I think that's a challenge for all of us to uh, know, believe that um, prayer can make a difference. Uh, there are efforts to for um, uh, faith communities to go to uh, Ukraine uh, to express solidarity. Pax Christi in Italy par participated recently in a, in a caravan uh, to Lviv to bring humanitarian goods, but mostly to express support. So it's an important part of what we're doing. We will um, send to you a link uh, to this uh, gathering, to this recording. Uh, and uh, other information, Rose Berger's been uh, great at putting in the chat lots of links and information from uh, Maria's slides and from the conversation. But we do need to wrap it up. The, the current war in Iraq, I mean, I'm sorry, the current war in Ukraine is not only a catastrophe in itself, but it has already, as you've noted, begun to fuel a new arms race and to make nuclear abolition much less likely. It's a tremendous challenge. At a time when the world urgently needs to address climate change and to meet the needs of the most marginalized and impoverished communities, the Ukraine war is taking us in a calamitous direction. For the sake of present and future generations, we have to replace the logic of violence in which we are mired with a new logic of nonviolence. Pope Francis' condemnation of the war, in spite of his not naming Russia or President Putin, his condemnation of war could not be more clear. He said, war is madness. Wars are always unjust. He said, the moment has come to abolish war, to erase it from human history before it erases human history. Enough, he said, stop it. May the weapons be silenced. Let us be serious about peace. But it will not be enough to hope for a new world. We have to build it. And we in Pax Christi, in Pax Christi's Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, are convinced that nonviolence is the only way to do so. Nonviolence, which is <clears throat> broader than pacifism, is a spirituality, a way of life, and a universal ethic at the core of our humanity. It is more than an ideal. It is more than aspirational. As we've been seeing in Ukraine, nonviolence from civil resistance to, to diplomacy and negotiations and many other efforts can be a very effective tool on the way to just peace. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Most especially, thank you, Maria, 
and um, we'll look forward to being in touch.